Two things. One, you said you were going to end it on a happy note, so you put a picture of the <laughs> yeah, well, no, but we, but, we, but we've gone by this point, right? We've left yeah. and we happily live in somewhere else in the galaxy. So. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> and the other thing is, when you were saying about creating more protons and stuff, and then everything going to, well, black holes and doom and stuff, yeah. but wouldn't there be more matter so you could potentially build more stars then? Once you've got on enough more matter, since you make the protons to gain more energy in different ways, basically. Uh, yes, except you, you do run into a problem, and the problem is is that anything you do it tends to be inefficient. So if you ask how much energy you would need to create enough protons to create a star, etc., it's more energy than you get from the star itself. So it, it, it's. So you have more than one star there. But uh, future technology, we might be able to. Yeah, that's, that's what I do. I normally just say engineering problem and let the engineer solve it. <laughs> but there is a famous saying, and it's that you cannot beat the laws of thermodynamics. They win every time. And they discovered this when they built steam trains and suddenly realized you can't run steam trains as fast and as efficient as you want. It's the same rules that govern everything else in the universe. Things are inefficient, you lose energy, and so. Um, <laughs> So it's going to be hard work to make more stars. And you had another very quick question, right? <laughs> if you couldn't beat them at the game of, well, if you couldn't beat the laws of physics or whatever it was you said, change it, basically. It's yes, been, yes, trillions, change trillions the laws of, of physics. <laughs> Not change them, but change some way to do it. It's been trillions of years, really. Uh, that's well, right. It, it, and and it, could be, really it could be that we've got thermodynamics wrong. But it would be a surprise, because it's pretty fundamental. I so. don't think I wanted that right. <laughs> Can we have this guy in the middle, and then we'll have uh, this question up here as well. Please. When you spoke of the death of life in seven billion years, do you not um, take the theory, which I've read, that in 500 to a billion years, the Earth will be getting too hot for life? You're putting it much further back. Oh, well, they're... they're Exactly when Earth will become uninhabitable as the sun expands is not a very well-defined thing. We actually know that a few, a couple of billion years before the sun basically throws off its outer layers, that it will have gotten so bright that it will have radically affected the atmosphere, probably boiled off the oceans, but life may still survive underground at that point. But when the sun engulfs the Earth, all bets are off. Uh, the Earth will vanish from being. Oh, we've got one up there. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I've got something to do with the conservation of energy. If you've got a photon that leaves a far distant uh, sun yes. that's identical to our sun, yes. it leaves the surface, it's the same processes on that sun as on our sun. Yes. It leaves the surface, it's red shifted, so it's lost energy. Where's that energy gone? I love this question. Um, okay. Can I give you some bad news to start with? What, Effective, more, what more bad news? More bad news. <laughs> Effectively, uh, you've been lied to all the way through school. Now, I know this comes as a surprise. That was right? a long time ago. Yeah. So, so, so conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is a very well-defined thing in a very well-defined system. The one place that conservation of energy does not hold is in the universe itself. The universe, we could do a GR lecture, I've got all night, right? The universe itself does not obey a conservation of energy law because it changes over time. And that, that change over time gives you a non-conservation of energy. So the energy doesn't go anywhere, it's just not conserved when you deal with processes involving changes of the entire universe. I'm talking to a light up there. I have no idea if I'm looking at you or... Oh, there you are. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, conservation of energy does not work in an expanding universe. This leads to many arguments, especially in the pub. But it's <laughs> what the mathematics show. Are you <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a, a question from up here. Can we get... Is anyone more... Any more hands up? Okay. Um, oh. Mine is... Uh, Really, uh, why would you want to interfere with the evolution of new species? 
um, a new plant by essentially saving humankind. Why would you want to? Yes. Well, for, for me, uh, well, so, um, for, for me, the evidence is growing that at, the, at this time, there's only one place in the universe where there's anything remotely close to intelligent life, and that's here. Life might be common in the universe, but it's probably going to be more similar to pond scum than living beings. And I actually think we have a bit of an imperative that if we can continue and can continue to think and wonder about the universe, that we should. Um, that's just my personal feeling, though. As I mentioned, I'm going to give the cockroaches a chance, all right? <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I, I am firmly not advocating that I, it's guaranteed that we will be the dominant species on this planet in a million years. It could be something completely different. But I said, this is the planet that has life on it. So hopefully there would be this imperative for life to keep going. I would hate to get to seven billion years and life just going, oh, bugger. <laughs> <laughs> There was another a mic over here somewhere. Do you have any more questions? Is there one up there, Martin? Okay, should we, should we just have this chat down here and then we'll go up? Um, there was a theory that the expansion of the universe would stop and that there would be a contraction and that the universe would disappear in a big crunch. Is that dead now? Effectively, yes. Since the discovery of dark energy... The idea that the universe will undergo a collapse in the sense of born collapse. There's not enough matter in the universe to provide enough gravity to stop the expansion and pull it back. Now, there are some ideas, like what I mentioned, where the universe could have a rebirth, but it will not go through a crunch to get there. If you wanted to make a big crunch, you'd have to magic matter into the universe to provide extra gravitational pull. Again, I'm talking to somebody, I'm not sure if it's the person who asked the question, I got blinded by staring at the light and I can't see anything. <laughs> but um, there's, there's not, there doesn't appear to be enough matter in the universe to cause the expansion to turn around and go back down to a, a big crunch. I, I, in fact, it's kind of interesting, when you look at the textbooks that were written roughly you know, 50 years ago, people talked about the various options of an open universe, a, a universe which is critical and one that will crunch. And basically, if you read the textbook, they said, we need to find out how much matter and radiation and energy is in the universe. What we did at the end of the 90s is we found out how much matter, radiation, and stuff is in the universe to tell us that we're not going to crunch, we haven't got an open universe, we do have something that appears that it's uh, going to go through uh, this deceleration, then acceleration into the future. Yeah. So astronomers did a good job, that's all I was saying. Did you have another question up there? Okay, and then there's a uh, second row from the back, middle sector. It was actually the same question. I was going to ask about the big bounce, but I think that's the same as the big crunch, isn't it? Yes. A big crunch is uh, a, a crunch without a bounce. So, <laughs> again, I'm not sure who I'm looking at. This is very, very this, disconcerting. Uh, Geraint, is there not just another universe we can tunnel through to? Well, ah, the, so the, the notion of there being other universes, is, it's, again, it's a bit of an ugly ground at the moment between philosophers, astronomers, particle physicists. People do think that there's, there's potentially this thing called the multiverse, uh, that they, you have different universes all sort of evolving on their own. Nobody knows if you could tunnel between these universes, but when we understand gravity and quantum mechanics well enough, maybe there will be a way to distort gravity to allow us to do that, but at the moment it seems impossible. If they're there. If they're there, <laughs> yes, and that, that's another ugly argument. Dark energy, and mm -hmm. the, about 70% of the universe is dark energy, and we, we don't really know what it is. And then later on you mentioned um, stars moving away so quickly that, we, that people in the future wouldn't be able to see them. That's right. So to me there seems to be a correlation there. Um, could you know, people in the future, they're looking at that they perhaps know that there's something there but can't see them, but that's what we're experiencing now. That, that's right, but they will get to a point when there will be nothing left to see. <coughs> so once you've reached that point, once everything beyond our local part of the universe has gone, the night sky beyond the local stars will be completely and utterly blank and black. There will be nothing to see. 
So you don't have anything to get a handle on. You can't say, oh, that object is moving away from me because you can't see anything. But it seems to, it seems to me that we're having the same mystery now. We, we, we can't, we, we haven't we, Well, we can see objects moving away from us. We know that something must be causing that acceleration. What we can't work out is what that stuff is that is in the universe. But we, we can infer it from what we see going on in the distant universe. But in the future, if you can't see the distant universe, how are you going to infer that this stuff is there? It will still be there, uh, but you won't be able to basically measure it because you won't see anything else out there in the distant universe. Thank you. There's a question, just uh, if you go next row and along a little bit, and then... I, I meant a little bit further along, actually. Um, <laughs> we'll come, don't worry, we'll come back to you, but um, pass along just four people and then back one, and then... <laughs> I'm sure you can do the this reverse. Is like, this is like battleships. <laughs> so I'm doing my GCCs at the moment, and my textbook still includes things like the Big Crunch, and obviously we're still using kind of Newtonian gravitation as opposed to kind of spatial relativity. Do you have any other examples in physics where we're basically being lied to about what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, I'm a, I said I'm a, uh, I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sydney. I teach undergraduate physics. I feel an awful lot of what I teach is saying, forget what you learned at high school. So that, um, it's co quantum mechanics is a big one. Uh, you know, uh, how long have you got? Uh, you know, I get students coming up to me who think that electrons are really particles that sometimes behave as waves, and light is really a wave that sometimes behaves as particles, whereas quantum mechanics says that it's neither of those. They both exhibit particle and wave kind of behaviors. Uh, yeah, the entire gravity thing is, and cosmology is, is, is very messed up. Um, <laughs> after you've done your GCSEs and you're going to university, prepare to continuously change your worldview on what physics is telling us. I hope that helps. <laughs> it becomes more <laughs> exciting. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Go ahead. Dark energy, you know, the fact that there's whatever it is, 70% or so of the universe is this dark energy that it seems we don't really know much about. That seems a bit troubling. Are, 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 are Just a little. Are there some ideas as to what it might be? Oh. Um, and, and, you know, what is the key observational evidence for it? Is it just that the universe, we see it expanding and therefore there must be something making it expand? Or uh, No, it's not the expansion, it's the acceleration of the expansion. That's the important part. So we see the expansion accelerating. We can measure that by looking at uh, distant exploding stars, distant supernova. That tells us that there, there must be stuff in the universe. So the question of what it is is an interesting one. You sort of think that... Or maybe, you know, we're all sitting there going, what is it? What is it? We don't know. The big problem is, is that when you have this kind of mystery, it's the realm that theorists run to. Because you can write papers on it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And with all kinds of potential tests that we can't do yet. So we don't know which of the many thousands of ideas is potentially correct, or if any of them are. The... One of the favored examples is that it's actually a property of the vacuum itself. And what I mean by that is that if I have a box, uh, and it's good old classical Newtonian physics, and I said to you, there's nothing in the box, right? No air, etc. There's a vacuum in the box. And I ask you, what's in the box? You just go, nothing. And everyone just goes, like, that's great. And then I say, right, now I'm going to introduce quantum mechanics. There's still nothing in the box. And I say, what's in the box? And you go, nothing. And you go, wrong. There's energy in the box. Because quantum mechanics allows energy, basically, to pop in and out of existence, right? So you get these fluctuations in energy. Now, that's, that's observed. You can observe that in the lab, right? It's, it's a real thing. It's not something that a bunch of particle physicists who were drunk down the pub made up just so we have something to talk about. If you don't include the fact that the vacuum itself has energy, you cannot accurately predict the spectrum of light you get from a hydrogen atom. Right? It's the simplest test. You've got to include it. So it's there. And it has the right properties to cause the universe to accelerate. The big problem is, is that if that is the source of dark energy, when we calculate theoretically how much energy we should have compared to how much we can see, we're out by a tiny factor of around 10 to the 120. <laughs> okay? So it's a great idea except it doesn't quite work because of this huge factor. Okay. But that's the favorite idea. 
right? Uh, it's the person doing the GCSE, we need help, so can you hurry up and finish? <laughs> <laughs> so we have one, two, three, and four, and I don't know, and five, I don't know where the microphones are, so whoever gets them first, I say. The chap over here could do with the mic. Right. Um, uh, another question about dark energy. People I love dark energy. <laughs> I did read that it was um, that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Yes, accelerating. Right, and I did read that there was going to be um, a big rip. Ah. It was going to rip apart. Is that still going to happen? And if so, when? <laughs> All right. So, as I mentioned, there are lots of ideas about what dark energy is. One of these. Right, so imagine I got a big row of dark energy ideas. The favorite one is one here, one that Einstein came up with called the cosmological constant. We like that one because it's a nice, simple one. These on this side, they're interesting too. These on this side, they have a special name. They're called phantom energy. Right? Why? Because they cause the expansion to accelerate faster and faster and faster, such that the expansion of the universe would firstly rip apart our galaxy, separate the stars, and then would rip apart the stars, and then rip apart the atoms that make up the stars. So this is this notion of the big rip. But we don't know where along here we sit with our idea, where, with what dark energy is. So it's a theoretical idea, but we can't tell this theoretical idea from that theoretical idea, from that one with the observations that we currently have. So it's a possible. If you spoke to most people, they'd say, nah. There's, something weird about phantom energy, we, we don't really worry about it too much. I said it's this cosmological constant where people have their money. We have the lad in the t-shirt. Um, so say we've got to however many billion years in the future where uh, we can only see our local group uh, mm -hmm. because the rest of the other stars are too far away. Say in, in another local group, um, a photon comes out of a star and it's, it's traveling at the speed of light and the other star is moving away from us because surely nothing can move faster than the speed of light, how can we be moving fast enough away from that photon that that photon will never reach us? Okay. Did you hear the answer to about energy conservation? Yeah. It's basically the same answer. Um, <laughs> the, the restriction on the speed of light doesn't hold for an expanding universe. That, so let, let's, let, let me just be clear, right, what I mean by that. When I say nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that means if I'm in this room and there's a beam of light and I try to outrun it, it will win every time, probably by quite a bit, right? <laughs> but because the universe is expanding, then if I fire a light beam from here over to there, asking them over there how fast is that light beam moving with respect to you, it's not necessarily the speed of light because space is expanding in between. So essentially, the expansion of space is like trying to run on a, a stretchy piece of, of rubber, right? Is that your target is moving away from you no matter how fast you run. So uh, th there, there will always be photons traveling towards things, but they will never get there because the space in between just keeps getting bigger and bigger faster than they can cover the distance. You should do some cosmology, it's great. <laughs> hey, do we have any other questions or any people with microphones? Uh, a question down here. Can we have a one down here in the middle, uh, two rows back, as well? Okay. Wait. Uh, I'm not sure how far that's. Do you want to go first, and then we'll come to you? Um, thank you. Um, I must say, I've always thought of uh, dark energy as the dirty socks in the cosmic laundry basket, and when they're left alone, they blow the, the lid off. Uh, and if we're talking about continuous creation of space-time, I'd have thought Hoyle was turning in his grave um, on having been argued out of continuous creation of matter. Um, if all we know about it is its observed facts, um, is it isotropic uh, in terms of the acceleration? Did the acceleration start at some time in the past, and is it changing? So, three questions in one, right? So, you know, you're getting your money's worth here. Number one, is it isotropic? As far as we can tell, yes. Because if we look at supernova on one side of the sky and supernova on the other side of the sky, they look to be doing the same kind of thing. Um, I've forgotten what the other two questions were. 
Yes, um, so dark energy has always been here. The question is how much does it dominate? So what has happened in the universe is dark energy has sat here, matter has continuously thinned out. As matter has thinned out, its gravitational pull has gotten weaker relative to the expansion due to um, dark energy, and they passed a point roughly half the age of the universe ago where dark energy started to dominate and the expansion has started to accelerate. And it looks like that point is the same when you look in different directions on the sky, which is why we think it's homogeneous. I think there was a third part, which was about the rate, whether it's been constant. As far as we can tell, I said we have a big list of potential um, theories. Some of these theories have dark energy changing with time. Some of them don't. This one here, which is a cosmological constant, which hasn't changed over the age of the universe, is the one which is currently the best description of the data, as far as we know. So it doesn't look like it's changed its spots at all. Do you have dark energy explaining cosmic inflation? Ooh, that's, a, ooh, that's another good question. So, uh, yes. So there was this rapid burst of inflation when the universe was born. The question is, is um, was dark energy present there? It would have to be present at a higher value to cause that acceleration. And then it's dived off down to nothing and is now coming back. Or were they two separate things? And at the moment, we can't tell. There are some that think that that uh, inflation at the start and the expansion today is somehow related to the Higgs field, which existed all through the universe. But again, the mechanisms, there's something missing. We haven't got the full picture, but some people think that they could be related. Question here. Simple one. What is the universe expanding into? <laughs> OK. What, what is the economy expanding into? There we go. I would say nothing. Else, yeah. But so, so let, no, but let, I will try not to be. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very serious question, right? What is the universe expanded into? So, when I write down my equations of relativity, okay, I have various bits and pieces to work with. I have a time, and I have three spatial dimensions, and I have the other bits and pieces that tell me how gravity works. Okay, that time and that x y z covers all points at all times in the universe. There is nothing extra. So inside general relativity, there, I mean, if you want to talk about somewhere else, there are no coordinates I could talk about because it's not part of the mathematical theory. Okay? So in terms of general relativity, everything is in that set of mathematics. Okay? So either you've got a universe which is infinite in extent, or you have a closed universe, like a sphere, and you can talk about every point on that sphere, but you can never talk about points inside and outside because that's not part of the mathematics. Now, some people have this idea uh, from, from M theory, where M stands for mm, um, <laughs> that our universe exi potentially exists in a higher number of dimensions, you know, 20 dimensions or something, and that our universe would be a sheet or something in 20 dimensions. But when you write down the mathematics of that, you've got T, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can talk about points outside of our universe because you have coordinates for outside of our universe. Uh, but that's just an idea of what the potential universe could be. So it could be expanded in, in, in M theory, or it might not be a question which has an answer given the mathematics we do. Wasn't that simple a question, was it? <laughs> so, Another hand up over there. Any more hands? Ah, yes, down here. Do you want to go first? You'll probably get your mic soonest, I think. Hello. <laughs> that was very odd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder what's leading you to the conclusion that while their life might be abundant in the universe, intelligent life might only be here. Because... To, for two things. Number one, we don't know why we're an intelligent species. We don't even know if we're an intelligent species. But we don't know why. Because evolutionary, it's a very, very, you know, select thing to be is a big-brained creature that solves problems. Right? As we know, for many creatures, you can have reasonably simple brains and just be stronger than the competitor. So why, why us? now having this ability to ponder the universe, okay? It, and if you talk to people that study evolutionary biology, right, you, they say to you, well, if you ran the Earth again, 
then maybe you would never get an intelligent species. Maybe everything's fine just basically eating the thing which is slower and weaker than it. Uh, you won't have to have this big brain to think about um, problems. The other reason is the fact that we see no evidence of any other intelligent life. Not including the Americans who meet people on dark roads, right? But when we look out into space, if there was, if there, so the idea is simple, right? Is if you have an intelligent species, eventually it gets off its planet and it would colonize stars. So how long would it take a species like us to colonize the entire galaxy? It's so roughly 10 million years. Now you might say, 10 million years, that sounds like a long time, but it's nothing compared to the lifespan of a galaxy. Life's been on Earth for billions of years, right? So if intelligent life had risen earlier, you would expect that life to have gone off and established itself in the universe. We see no signs of intelligent life anywhere we look. We would, we would see them using starlight. This is my favorite one. If, if they built Dyson spheres, we would know because there would be no starlight left. They'd be using that starlight and reprocess it into infrared radiation. We see no signatures of Dyson spheres or anything similar. So we have just no evidence at all that there's intelligent life, at least in our galaxy, if not in other galaxies. I think we probably have time for one more, and I think you already have a mic over here, unless there's any more final hands. Okay, let's, and then we'll do the last, okay, last one to you. Do you want to do the two, one question and the other, and then, great, you can answer both. Okay. Um, you started off telling us about the fact that we didn't fully understand the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. You showed us the new radio telescopes are being built in South Africa and Australia. Yep. Tomorrow... You are in charge of that program. Am I? And I would like Bloody you to hell. tell us what experiments you would set up to improve our knowledge of the Big Bang. As well. Okay, let me let that stew, but I do have an yeah. answer. <laughs> and then the question, the question here. Um, would it be possible to make another energy slash light source that's not a star that wouldn't die out so that life could still live forever. Okay, I'll, I'll do this one first. Why not? The thing is, stars are really good at producing energy because they use nuclear reactions. They're very efficient. The only thing which is more efficient than a star is, well, actually, I should take that back. Stars are not that efficient. But they, if, they, if they're big enough, they, they burn for long enough that you can use them to, uh, to, to generate uh, energy for a long time. The only other thing you could do is use black holes. Uh, and pour matter into them, and that matter just swirls around and gets hotter. The thing is, is that um, other than that, what other sources of energy could you use to produce even more condensed energy in a particular place? Other than nuclear reactions, which are the most powerful force in the universe, and gravity, which is exceptionally strong in a black hole because you've got so much mass there, there's nothing else left there to generate huge amounts of energy that we know of. Now, it, that might change into the future, if we, have, um, if we have to revise aspects of our laws of physics, if we find out these additional forces. But at the moment, stars are amongst our best bet, as are black holes. And this question, um, if I was put in charge of the SKA, I would say to you, number one, the SKA was not built to study the Big Bang. It was built to study the evolution of the universe after the Big Bang. And I would say to you that the problem is not uh, to do with telescopes because we've seen as far as we're ever going to see, right? We've seen the cosmic microwave background, we're not going to see any further. What is missing is the theoretical side. What we need are smart people to think about the problems. And what we need is uh, not old crusties like me whose brains have addled, but we need young people with new ideas to try and put together gravity and quantum mechanics and make them work, because once we've done that, We'll have the mathematical rules that will allow us to see what happened before the Big Bang. And on that happy note, I think that's where we'll have to wrap it up. I think the one message to take home is that um, for anyone who wants to study cosmology, there's clearly plenty of questions left unanswered. So uh, we need help. Yeah, thanks to Drake. <laughs>